Okay, so now we're going to consider the classic figure skater example. So if you haven't already done so, I encourage you to watch the demo video that I made talking about conservation of angular momentum. And so all the concepts that we're going to be talking about here were covered in that demo video, including some nice demos and so on, so you could see concretely this stuff happening. Now we're just going to take all those concepts and we're going to apply them more quantitatively to the to the figure skater example. So we're going to put some math to to our thinking, to our to our concepts, to our ideas. Okay, and so you know the basic phenomenon. The idea is we've got a figure skater. She starts with her arms stretched out like this and with some angular uh, velocity. And then as she pulls her arms inwards like this, she decreases her moment of inertia. But in order to conserve angular momentum then, her angular velocity must increase. She has to spin faster. Okay, so I want to emphasize this is a super important um, physics concept to understand. It has applications across the board for like terrestrial physics, like weather systems and so on, and also the you know, astrophysics, formations of solar systems, and formation of galaxies, and accretion disks of black holes. It's just all over the place it applies. The idea that when angular momentum is conserved, if you reduce the moment of inertia, you have to increase the angular velocity in order, to, in order for the angular momentum to remain constant. Very important um, uh, physics here concept. <clears throat> okay, so we'll look at this in the case of the figure skater. So our picture looks something like this. We've got a figure skater, and these are her legs. Okay, and they're coming together at the bottom just to indicate that what's touching the ice is just a small piece of the tip of her skate. <clears throat> and so as she spins around, the the um, the ice will exert a very small, very negligible uh, frictional torque. Okay, so the external torque is, is basically zero for practical purposes. Okay, and she starts with her arms stretched out. And say her arms are passing through center mass point like this. She starts with her arms stretched out like this, and she has some angular velocity, which is um, uh, about the axis passing, about the vertical axis passing through her center of mass. So she's got some initial angular velocity, omega initial pointing upwards. So we put our thumb in the direction of the angular velocity vector, our fingers curl um, in the direction in which she is spinning. And then the magnitude of omega initial <coughs> is the magnitude of her initial you know, radians per second angular velocity. Okay, now as she pulls her arms in like this, her moment of inertia goes down, so her angular velocity must increase. So afterwards, after she's pulled her arms in, you know, and maybe her legs still look the same. Okay, but her arms have come in like this. And so we'll indicate that like that. Basically what she's done is she's taken masses that were um, held further out and thus contributing uh, um, uh, gr more more greatly to the moment of inertia. She's pulled them in closer to the axis of rotation, so they contribute less to the moment to her, to her moment of inertia. And as a consequence, her angular velocity is going to increase. And so we have an omega final, which is greater than omega initial. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how that happens. Okay, um, now. The first thing we're going to do is we need to model her body. Okay, so we need to figure out what her moment of inertia is. Okay, now um, as physicists, what we do is we always construct the simplest possible model that captures the essential physics. What's the essential physics here? Well, she had masses that were originally held far away from the axis of rotation and thus contributing greatly to her moment of inertia to uh, a later situation where she's pulled the masses in closer to her axis of rotation and thus they contribute less to her moment of inertia. So all that really matters is masses out here move to here. Okay, so we're going to ignore her the moment of inertia associated with her torso and her head and all that stuff and we will model her body as just a, um, a massless rigid rod like this. And then attached to that massless rigid rod are her arms. And so our, her arms we're also going to model as massless rigid rod on the, her left arm is a massless rigid rod of length r with a mass point mass m attached to the end. And her right arm is similarly a massless rigid rod uh, of length r with a mass point mass m attached to the end of that. And so that's it. So her body consists of two elemental um, rigid bodies. Just a point mass m located at perpendicular distance r away from the axis of rotation. Okay. And so the moment of inertia for this rigid body, for rotation about that axis, center mass point here, um, is, is simple. It's just I is equal to mr squared from her left uh, arm plus mr squared from her right arm. So that's 2 times mr squared. 
Now the crucial thing, I'll emphasize it again, is uh, this R squared term here. Okay, so if the masses are located here, well then they contribute uh, something to her moment of inertia. But if she puts the masses twice as far out, uh, 2 squared is 4. Those masses now contribute uh, four times as much to the moment of inertia when they're out here than when they're here. Okay, so this R squared is a very important factor. Okay, so, <clears throat> so okay. So what we want to do is we want to establish that basically once she gains some angular momentum, you know, she pushes against the ice, exerts a torque on herself, there's an angular momentum transmitted from, transferred from the earth into her, and then she's spinning. So once she's in this state spinning, she's got some angular momentum. And, <clears throat> and then um, her skates are just touching uh, at a single point. Like I said, very little frictional torque and so on. We want to establish that that angular momentum that she has will remain constant. So the idea is what causes changes in angular momentum is torques. Okay, so when we talked about a system of particles, like here, a very simple system, we have two. When we talked about a system of particles in general, we said that, well, the sum of the internal torques needs to equal zero, and generally it is. So in any sort of situation where you've got, say, contact forces acting, and they are of the nature F12 equals minus F21, then those, any internal for torques that arise, they all cancel out. Okay? And that's really what's happening here. You know, she's exerting whatever those forces are that, re that you know, for required to pull those masses in, while those forces are of the nature F12 equals minus F21, and they're contact forces and so on. So we can be assured that when she pulls her arms in, she is not exerting any internal torques that will change her angular momentum. And you can see it, it's, it's obvious in, in this case, because what she's doing is she's, when she pulls the mass in, she's exerting a force in that direction, you know, applied here, and so R cross F, R and F are anti-parallel, and so R cross F is zero. So her pulling those masses in cannot exert any torque, internal torques on her to change her angular momentum. <clears throat> and so then we have to look at external torques. So the external torques acting on her are also at least approx to a good approximation zero. So as we said, um, um, the only thing that's the only the, the extra, what are the external forces acting? Well, there's gravity pulling her down and normal force push, pushing up. All those cancel and wouldn't exert any torques anyway. And but there is her skate. Her skate is touching uh, the ice, and so it's rotating like this. And so there are forces, but the but the moment arm for those forces is very small. Uh, torque is R cross F. R is really really small. Uh, and so whatever F is, R cross F is going to be small. And so the rotational torque, the, the, the frictional torque that the ice exerts on her is going to be negligibly small. Okay, and so, um, so there's no net torque acting on this system of particles. And so whatever angular momentum it had to begin with, like in this situation, it has to stay. It has to be constant. Angular momentum in this situation equals the angular momentum in this situation. Okay, so that angular momentum of this system of masses is... It's just the angular momentum of a rotating body, so it's just I omega. So that angular momentum is in the upwards direction, always, and so we'll just consider its magnitude. So that's the magnitude of the angular momentum is L, and that magnitude of the angular momentum is going to remain constant regardless of what she does with these masses. Okay, And that angular momentum is um, like mass times velocity is moment of inertia times angular velocity, is I times omega. Okay, and so the basic idea here is that um, she starts with a, a large moment of inertia, uh, so a large i and a small omega, and then as she brings her arms in, the moment of inertia goes down, and so her angular velocity must go up, so that the product of those two remains constant. Okay, so what is, so in other words, the, the angular momentum at any instant of time is equal to the initial angular momentum. Well, what was that? Well, it was i initial, times omega initial. So I initial is 2m times R initial squared, where R initial is the, is, is the length of her arm when they're stretched out like this initially. And so that's got to equal I final times omega final. Okay, so I final is 2m R, R final squared, where she's brought her arms in closer, so R final is less than R initial. Okay, so I final is less than I initial, so omega final has to be greater than omega initial so that the product remains the same, so that her angular momentum remains constant because there's no net torque acting. Okay, so that's the basic idea here. Great. 
And so <clears throat> what we'll do is consider a concrete uh, example. We will suppose that uh, whatever her, um, however far her arms are stretched out to begin with, that's our initial. We're going to take our final to be one half that value. Okay, just to be uh, get some concrete numbers here. So our example is going to be uh, that the ratio of our final to our initial is equal to one half. Okay, and so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that um, we can work out the ratio of omega final to omega initial. Okay, so omega final. Remember, in physics, it's very often um, much more useful to work out ratios of things, okay, ratios of energies, uh, ratios of angular velocities. So we're going to compare the, the final angular velocity with the initial angular velocity. So the ratio of omega final uh, to omega initial. Okay, so what is that? Well, omega final divided by omega initial is I initial divided by I final. Okay, and so what is the ratio of I initial to I final? Well, I initial is 2MR squared, where R is equal to R initial, so that's the large distance. And then we divide that by I final, so that's 2MR squared, where R is now all R final, one half of R initial our final square. So the two m's cancel out, and it's just the ratio of our initial to our final squared. Okay, so our final or our, our initial is a half, so initial over final is 2, squared is 4. Okay, so it tells us that <coughs> with this simple model for the skater, <coughs> when her uh, regardless of what the masses are or R's are or whatever, the point is that if she's holding them out like this and she's spinning with a certain angular velocity, if she pulls those masses in to half of their original distance, then her angular velocity will quadruple. She'll be spinning four times as fast in order to conserve angular momentum. Okay, so, <clears throat> so her moment of inertia went down, her angular velocity went up, such that the product remains the same. Okay, <clears throat> okay very good. Okay, so now when this happens, then her kinetic energy is going to go up. Okay, so let's think about that for a second. So the kinetic energy associated with rotational motion is equal to, actually let me do it this first. The kinetic energy associated with translational motion, so the kinetic energy associated with translational motion is one half mv squared. Okay, but, um, but the linear momentum is mass times velocity. So this is equivalent to the linear momentum, p squared divided by 2m. Okay? In exactly analogous fashion, the kinetic energy associated with the rotational motion that we're talking about here is equal to 1 half i omega squared. Okay? But the angular momentum is i times omega. So this is equivalent to the angular momentum squared divided by twice i. Okay, So instead of the linear momentum squared divided by twice m, it's the angular momentum squared divided by twice i. Now, <clears throat> this is an extremely useful form to look at because you can tell instantly that <laughs> whatever kinetic energy she's got to begin with, right? There's some. The, it's equal to her angular momentum squared divided by 2i. Now, as she pulls her arms in and changes her i, the L does not change, but the i decreases. And it's in the denominator, so that means her kinetic energy goes up. Okay, so we can see that immediately. So if her, so the ratio of i's here, you can see this, the ratio of i's is, is a factor of 4. So whatever her i started off with, it becomes one quarter that value in that final situation. So her kinetic energy final must be four times as big as her original kinetic energy. So you can see that immediately. Okay, so, <clears throat> so we can look at, uh, let's, let's do this. Um, um, yeah, okay, let's do delta change in kinetic energy. So the change in the kinetic energy is kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. And what we want to do is compare that change in kinetic energy to the original kinetic energy in, in her motion. Okay, so we'll rewrite this as kinetic energy final over kinetic energy initial minus 1 times kinetic energy initial. 
Okay, and so the change in the kinetic energy is some fraction of the original kinetic energy, or some multiple of the original kinetic energy. Okay, so it's always useful to do compare a change in kinetic energy to the original kinetic energy. So what's interesting is this quantity in brackets there. Okay, so let's work this out. So her kinetic energy final is equal to <coughs> L squared divided by twice I final. And then we want to divide by kinetic energy initial. So we'll multiply by 1 over kinetic energy initial, which would be twice I initial divided by L squared. Okay, and then we subtract 1 times kinetic energy initial. And so <coughs> the angular momentum is the same in both, so that cancels out, the 2 cancels out. So it's just I initial over I final minus 1 times the original kinetic energy. Okay, so it's just I initial over I final minus 1 times the initial kinetic energy. And we work this out. So I initial divided by I final in this example is just 4. And so we get 4 minus 1 is 3 times the original kinetic energy. So she had some original kinetic energy, Ki, and the change in it was 3 times Ki. So her final kinetic energy is 4 times the original kinetic energy, which is what we said before. Because I has been reduced, which it goes like this to this, her moment of, iner of inertia is reduced by a factor of 4, so her kinetic energy must go up by a factor of 4. And so the increase over the initial is 3 times that. Okay, so that's a large increase in the kinetic energy. Okay, so now we have to ask, there's been an increase in the kinetic energy. Energy is a conserved quantity, so where did that energy come from? Okay, well, uh, to change kinetic energy, you do work. You know, force acting uh, through a displacement is work done as energy transferred, in this case, into uh, kinetic energy. Okay, so, but where is that work happening? Well, um, if you watch that demo video, it was really clear that, you know, these masses that she's holding on to here, uh, in order to keep them moving in uniform circular motion, uh, she needs to exert forces. So here are the two masses. How should I draw this picture? So here are the two masses, M, and here is her um, uh, center of mass here, and we're rotating with an angular velocity like that. And so these masses are in circular motion. And in order for those masses to move in circular motion, um, they, there needs to be a force directed towards the center of the circle. Okay, so actually, and you can feel it in that demo I was showing, um, you've got those masses and as you're spinning around, you have to exert an inward, a radially inward force to keep those masses uh, from moving along straight lines and to bend them into circular trajectories. Okay, so as she's just spinning in this situation, she's exerting radially inward forces. Okay? And so in order for her to bring those masses in like this, she has to exert this force plus a tiny bit more okay, to get them to start coming in like this. So what we're going to imagine is that she brings these masses in extremely slowly, and the force that she's exerting is just sort of epsilon above uh, the force that's required to keep them moving in centripetal, in circular motion. The, centri the centripetal force required to keep them moving in ever smaller uh, circles. Okay, <clears throat> so that's the plan here. So we're actually going to calculate this. Now this involves a little bit of calculus. If you don't know calculus, don't worry about it. If you do, you know, um, if, so if you don't, then just marvel at how powerful calculus is. And if you do, then you'll see how uh, this sort of calculation is done, because it's really quite nice. Okay, and so first of all, what is the magnitude of this force that she needs to apply to pull these guys in? Well, it's going to depend upon uh, the, the radial distance r. So this is the radial distance r. Okay, <clears throat> and so what is that? It's a force as a function of r. So that force, let me see if I can fit this here. So the magnitude of the force that she's going to need to apply is just infinitesimally above um, um, the, the centripetal force required for these masses to move in circular motion. And so the centripetal force is the mass times v squared divided by r. Okay, and the, uh, the v that we're talking about here is the tangential uh, uh, velocity. Uh, that these masses move on as they're going around these, these circles. And so we know that the tangential velocity is equal to r times the angular velocity omega. 
So we can replace V with R omega. And so we get um, M times omega squared times R. And now what is the angular velocity? Because remember, as she's pulling her arms in like this, she starts with some initial angular velocity, but as she decreases r, the angular velocity is increasing. So omega itself is a function of r. Well, what is that function? Well, if we go back to this expression over here, here we have omega final over omega initial is equal to r initial over r final. So what we're talking about is we're starting with some r initial, and we're going to reduce that r to some generic value r. So our r final is going to be just r, generic r. So omega, so if we just look at this equals this, we have that omega as a function of r is equal to omega initial, moving this up here is equal to this uh, initial omega that you have, times r initial divided by r final is just the final generic r that we've come to squared. OK, so the angular velocity, as she pulls those masses in, the angular velocity increases as r gets smaller. So when r is equal to r initial, r initial over r initial is 1, and omega at r initial is just omega initial. Okay, and as you uh, bring r um, uh, from r initial to r final, then you're going to get r initial over r final squared times the initial omega, which is in fact omega uh, final. Omega final is four times omega initial, and r initial over r final is uh, is two squared is four. Okay, so this is um, how omega depends upon uh, the radial distance that those masses are out. So let's plug that in here. Okay, and so what we're going to get is, <coughs> should we write this? We're going to get this m, and then we're going to get omega squared. If we square this thing, we get omega initial squared multiplied by um, um, r initial over r squared, and that gets squared. I'm going to run out of room here. So that force is equal to m. m times omega squared. Omega is a function of r. Let's square that. That's omega initial squared times r initial over r all squared. And then we square that. So that's r initial over r to the power of 4. And then we multiply that by that final r. And so we have uh, an r divided by an r to the fourth. So it goes like 1 over r cubed. So it's equal to m times omega initial squared times r initial to the fourth divided by r cubed. Okay, so the force that she needs to apply when r is large, so in the denominator, that's a cubed, so it's a small force. But as she brings those masses in and r decreases, say, from some value to one half of its value, one half cubed is uh, one eighth. And so the force required here versus here is eight times as large in order to keep them moving in, in, these, in this circular motion. That circular motion is getting faster and faster and faster. Okay, So that's great. So let's see. So um, as she is applying this force over that displacement, she's doing some work. Okay, So the work done is the integral of f dot dr. And that will be the change in the kinetic energy. OK, so the change in the kinetic energy, well, that's going to equal the work done. It's going to be equal to the energy transferred by moving these forces through those displacements. OK, and that work done is going to be twice the work done by one of those arms. Okay, So the work done by one of those arms, that's all we'll focus on, that's work is force dot displacement, the integral of force dot displacement. And we're going to be integrating from r initial, which is, which is far out, to r final, which is closer in. So r initial to r final. OK, so now we have a vector dot product here. What is the force vector? Well, the force as a vector, first of all, is in the negative r hat direction. It's radially inwards. So it's in the negative r hat direction. And its magnitude is this expression. OK, and what is the vector dr? Well, the vector dr by definition, is in the radial direction, so the r hat direction, times d of the integration variable, times dr. OK, so, <coughs> so when we do this, we have, we have to take the dot product of that vector with that vector. And so we'll have an r hat unit vector. 
vector dot product with negative r hat. Well, that's just negative 1. So we got a negative 2 there. Okay, and then what's left over is um, uh, the, uh, this thing times this. Now, in this expression, most of these are just constants that we can pull out of the integral. So we'll do that right away. We'll pull out the m omega initial squared r initial to the fourth. We'll pull that out of the integral. And all we have left is the integral of dr divided by r cubed from r initial to r final. So the integral of 1 over r cubed is negative 1 over 2 r squared. Okay, if you differentiate that, um, the derivative of r to the negative 2 is negative 2 over r cubed, and so you recover 1 over r cubed. Okay, and so what we have is just negative 2 times m omega initial squared r initial to the fourth times <coughs> The integral of 1 over r cubed is negative 1 over 2r squared. And we're evaluating it between these two limits, from between r initial and r final. Okay, and so that negative cancels that negative, and that 2 cancels that 2. Okay, and so what we're left with is m times omega initial squared times r initial to the fourth. And to get a simpler expression, we'll first just write down r initial squared. So we still have an r initial squared. Okay, so we have an r initial squared in the first case divided by 1 over, so times 1 over r final squared. Subtract the same r initial squared divided by 1 over r squared evaluated at, divided by r squared evaluated at r initial. So that's r initial squared. Okay, and so if we crank this out, so first of all, this is m. And then if we look at this, what is omega r? So omega r is, um, if we look at this, this picture here, or rather this picture over here, if we have omega times r, well, that's equal to the tangential velocity of, those, of, the, of that mass. Okay? So tangential velocity of that mass. So, and that's initially. Okay, so as these masses are swinging around at a distance r initial out with an angular velocity omega initial, then this is the initial <coughs> uh, tangential velocity of those masses. Okay, so that's uh, v initial squared. And then what we're left with here is simply r initial over r final squared. Well, here it is. r initial over r final squared is 4. Subtract r initial squared over r initial squared is 1. And so what we get is 3 times mv initial squared. Okay, so let's write it in this form. That's equal to 3 times 2 <coughs> times 1 half mv initial squared. Okay, so that 2 cancels that half. This is just 3 mv initial squared. 4 minus 1 is 3 mv initial squared. So why do we write it in that form? Well, we can see immediately 1 half mv initial squared, that's the kinetic energy associated with that mass rotating around with an angular velocity omega initial. And there's two of those masses, okay? And so this expression in square brackets here, well, that is the original kinetic energy. Okay, and so we see that that's equal to 3 times the original kinetic energy. That's exactly what we had uh, through this analysis. We said that, yep, as that, um, we know generally speaking, we know that the kinetic energy associated with rotation is L squared over 2i. So if you make i smaller, L remains constant. It's, 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 it's constant, there's no external torque. L is constant. If you make i smaller, kinetic energy goes up. Well, how much does it go up? Well, the change in the kinetic energy is three times the original kinetic energy. And so we said, well, where does that come from? Well, it comes from doing work. So um, as the skater pulls in these masses, there's a force acting over displacement. And so the work that, 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 that the skater does, we just calculated that work and equated that to the change in the kinetic energy. And we got the right answer. Okay? So that's exactly where that kinetic energy comes from. So if you apply conservation of total energy, you say, ah, yes. Well, we, all, we know that total energy, that energy is always conserved. So the energy of an isolated system can't change. So the kinds of energies involved here are there could be a change in kinetic energy, and there could be a change in uh, chemical energy in her body. So in this case, the kinetic energy went up. The change in kinetic energy was positive. It increased, um, you know, the change was three times the original. It increased fourfold. 
Okay, so the change in kinetic energy was positive in this case, and so that requires a negative change in chemical energy. So chemical energy in her body went down in order to tr in order to transfer in order to increase the kinetic energy of her rotational motion. Okay, so it's a really nice. This is a great example. The principal idea here is that when the angular momentum of an object is conserved, is constant because there's no external torques, then if you decrease the moment of inertia, which you can do, so you can you can take the masses that make up that object and redistribute them into something that has a smaller, same mass but smaller moment of inertia, and then. Um, so smaller moment of inertia, so then the angular velocity has to increase in order to conserve the angular momentum. And so uh, um, that increase in angular momentum is automatically associated with, um, sorry, that, that increase in angular velocity is automatically associated with an increase in the kinetic energy, because the kinetic energy is a constant divided by twice i. If you make i smaller, kinetic energy goes up. Where does it come from? Work. And we did the work calculation, and there you go. And so her chemical energy goes down as her kinetic energy goes up. So this is a really great example to, to really sort of master all of the aspects of this.